about 400 years ago, our forefathers, our American forefathers, braved an unknown ocean to come to this foreign land and settle on these shores. The, this unexplored, uncharted territory. They came with a dream of freedom and with vision and tenacity. And by the sweat of their brow, and by their blood, sweat, and tears, they forged the nation of this place. Many of them didn't make it over on the journey. Many died in that first winter. But we sometimes forget in the history books that they came in the name of religious freedom. They came because they believed in a new place where they could live out their devotion to Jesus Christ. The Puritans and the Pilgrims and the folks that first settled this nation were Christian people that believed in the one true God through His Son Jesus and by the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And they came with that vision that they could have religious freedom. They were scared that the culture in which they lived was bleeding over into their spiritual community. And so they envisioned this new place where they could worship God with all their strength and with all their might. And many of them paved the way with their blood, with their very lives. And they had this tradition that's been lost largely to us as Christians today called Thanksgiving Days. Now, not the feast that happened in 1621 that we celebrate this week, but they had days that they set aside simply for prayer and for fasting to thank God to have gratitude towards God for everything that he had done in their life. To have gratitude towards God for who he is and what he done and for his provision and for his care in their lives. They set aside those days just to thank him. Just to sing songs of praise and prayers of gratitude to God. And so Thanksgiving is not simply about turkey and ham and yams and, and pecan pie. Which I know y'all love that pecan pie because we almost had a riot last week when we were right now. <laughs> but Thanksgiving is about giving thanks to God, showing gratitude. And that's something that we should do every day. That we should gather together not to have a feast of, of turkey and ham, but a feast of gratitude, a, a banquet of the soul, of thanking God for what He's done in our life, the one true and living God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together in your word. We pray that your word would come alive in us, that you would speak into our hearts and our minds, that you would strengthen us, that you would call us ever deeper in our relationship with you, in our devotion to you. We thank you for this holiday this week to rest and reflect and give thanks to you for who you are and what you've done. So speak to us, Lord God, through your word this morning. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. I love this season. This is one of my favorite times of the year. Uh, we don't really get much of a winter here in Florida, but, but the trees turn the colors a little bit, and we get a little bit of a cool wind. We've got to turn the heat on once in a while. But I love, I love the whole thing. I love Thanksgiving. I love the turkey and the ham, the gathering together, the breaking of the bread. I love Christmas. I love uh, getting presents and setting up Christmas trees and the smiles and the joy on the face of those little children on Christmas morning and putting cookies out for Santa. I love the whole thing. I love everything about the season. And I, too, like everybody else, I'm susceptible to get caught up in the consumerism of the whole thing. To get caught up in, in the, the, the melee, the, the, the grind of Black Friday and, and, and cutting coupons and trying to find internet deals and worrying about how I'm going to put a feast on the table, worrying about am I going to have enough presents under the tree, worrying about am I going to put up a nice enough light show at the house. And I can get caught up in all those things, and I can forget what's at the heart, what's the meaning of the whole thing. Thanksgiving's not about the turkey and the ham, folks. 
It's about giving thanks to God. It's about the fellowship and the things that happen around the family table. It's about the love and, and the provision that God has placed in our life. And Christmas is not about Black Friday deals and cutting coupons and, and the mad rush fighting through the stores. It's about the most important moment in the history of the universe when God became incarnate, when he put on flesh and made his dwelling among us. It's about Jesus Christ, our Lord, and his coming into this world. Amen? Amen. You know, when I was in Momos and Lama Guatemala, and I know I talk about it a lot, and forgive me for that, but I believe that every human being, every United States of America citizen, should have the opportunity to go to a third world country and to live there for, for an extended period of time, weeks or months. And while I was there, I noticed that people didn't have hot water to bathe in. You couldn't even shave because you'd get infection from the water. They didn't have clean water to drink. They didn't have food to eat. They didn't have clothes to wear or shoes to put on their feet. They didn't have uh, uh, food stamps and government systems that, that provide when you don't have anything. And the churches have very little resources that really depend on us to send our tithe and offering to support them. There's no medical care, there's no system of government, there's no Medicaid and Medicare to, to, for them to get the medical care that they need. There's no uh, system in place to, to protect them. There's no highway uh, systems. There's these winding mountain passes that people fall and, and, and die all the time or crash their chicken bus. The people are hungry. The people are starving. But yet I noticed something about these people. They were always so full of joy. Always smiling. Always laughing. Always with, with thankful hearts to God. Even though they had nothing that we consider to be necessities here in this country. They were happy and excited and grateful. They had this value on the family that I've never seen before. They truly loved each other and family was everything to them. And I thought that I came to preach the gospel to them. But they preached an even greater gospel to me. Because they showed me what it's like to appreciate the simple things of life and to take joy in those things. And they don't do church the way we do church, by the way. It's not an hour-long session that we try to pack everything in so we get folks off to lunch on time. They have church for hours and hours and hours. It's an all-day thing. Right after the siesta, church happens, and it happens well into the night. The preacher can preach for hours. They sing songs thanking God. They hug each other. They laugh. And it's a celebration of joy and gratitude. Although just outside the walls, they don't have food, they don't have clothing, they don't have any of the necessities of life. They gather together in love with thankful and grateful hearts to praise the one and true living God. Amen. And it's forever impacted me, forever touched me, and showed me that as we gather together on Thanksgiving Day, eating turkey and ham and all the fixings, that we waste more food in one day in this country than those countries have in a year. And that children die of starvation every day there. Our Lord Jesus calls us to be kingdom people. He calls us to appreciate and take joy and gratitude in the simple things of life. To thank God for his, his care for us and to appreciate the blessings that he's poured out. In the Gospel of Matthew, in the 6th chapter, beginning in the 25th verse, Jesus is giving us instructions in his Sermon on the Mount, his, his preeminent teaching. He's teaching us about the kingdom, and he's teaching us how to be kingdom people. Jesus often spoke about the kingdom. Remember, he didn't come to start a religion. He came to proclaim a kingdom. John the Baptist says, Behold, there is one coming. The kingdom is coming. Repent and get ready. And then Jesus steps on the scene and says, the kingdom is here, the kingdom is now. In Jesus was the kingdom, here and now, the present reality of the kingdom in our lives. Jesus talked a lot about the kingdom, but he doesn't give us a clear definition of what the kingdom is. He doesn't say the kingdom is dot, dot, dot. He tells us what the kingdom is like through parabolic truths. He tells us that the kingdom is like 
a treasure that we find in the field. And once we find it, we'll sell everything we have to get it. He tells us that the kingdom is like yeast that works its way throughout the entire bread, the entire creation. He tells us that the kingdom starts start small like a mustard seed, the smallest of the seeds, but once it's planted in the fertile souls of the heart, it becomes the greatest tree where all the birds of the air can find their rest. He tells us that we are kingdom people, and he gives us these rules, this discourse, on what it means to be people of the kingdom and how we live. In the 25th verse, he says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Now I'm happy, I'm excited that all y'all have clothes to wear this morning. Amen? Amen. This place could get real ugly if we didn't all have clothes to wear. <laughs> and I, I think Jesus understands that we need to eat, we need to be clothed, we need to have something to drink. But he says, don't worry about those things. Don't make that the focus of your life. Don't exhaust your energy and your thinking and your time consumed with what you're going to eat and what you're going to drink and what you're going to wear. Don't kill yourself bending over backwards to make the Black Friday deals or put the, the food on the table. Jesus says, don't worry, don't be consumed about those things. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Isn't this wonderful creation that God has given us more than just what we eat or what we wear, those perishable, temporal things that are here today and gone tomorrow? Didn't Jesus come to bring us a deeper meaning to our lives than that? He says, look, look at the birds in the air. They don't sow or reap or gather in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Look at the creatures that we, we see as insignificant. Here are the birds of the air. They're not punching a time clock. They're not consumed on what they're going to save, what they're going to store. Now, they have to procure food. They have to live. But they're not consumed and worrying about it. Your Heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? Isn't that a beautiful statement of God's love and His care for us? That he loves you. That he cares for you. That you are much more valuable, you child of God, made in the image of God, than the birds of the air, and yet he feeds them. His providence is over all creation, down to the most minute creature. And any, can you add a single hour of your life by worrying? Can you add to your life by worrying about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear? You can't add anything to it, but you can shorten your life. Uh, medicine and scientists can tell us that today, that stress and anxiety and worry, they won't add to our life, but they'll take away from it. They cause cancer and sickness and disease. Jesus says, don't worry about those things. You can't add to your life by worrying. Why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they neither grow nor toil nor spin. The lilies of the field that the, the, the flowers that God created down to the most uh, distinct details with all the colors of the rainbow. Beautiful and, and everything that he's created testifies to his glory and his power. Yet not even Solomon in all his glory was clothed like one of these. Not even Solomon with all his gold and his silver and his silk and his pomp and grandeur was clothed even as beautiful as the lilies of the field. So why worry about those things? But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today, and is tomorrow thrown into the oven, then the grass of the field, which lifts up just for a minute towards the sun, and then it's here today and gone tomorrow, if God takes care of even the grass and the flowers, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? It's interesting to me how it always comes down to a matter of faith for Jesus. Over and over again, he tells the people about faith. He tells them uh, in Mark 11, 23, if you just have faith, you can tell the mountains where to go. He tells them in Luke 17, 6, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can uproot the mulberry tree and replant it on the sea. He says, go in peace. Your faith has healed you. Your faith has made you well. You have little faith. You have medale faith. You have great faith. Over and over again, he talks to people about their faith. 
Their, their trust in God, their hope in the things that they can't see and, and their assurance and the things that they're believing for, their faith. Being consumed and worried about the worries of the world is a lack of faith. It's a faith dilemma. It's not trusting God for who He is and what He can do. Therefore, don't worry saying what will we eat or what will we drink or what we will, will we wear. For it's the Gentiles who strive for all these things, and indeed your Heavenly Father knows you need all these things. Your Father knows you need to put turkey on the table for Thanksgiving. He knows you've got to put presents under the tree. He knows that you have needs. He knows you have food and water and clothing needs. And He loves us. And He cares for us. And He meets those needs. That's the good news that His providence is over all creation. All the universe is at His will. And Jesus says, but strive first for the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things will be added to you as well. Live your life one day at a time, just for today. <coughs> Don't worry about tomorrow. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Seek first the kingdom of God. We are kingdom people. Our concern should not be about food and, and clothing and drink. Our concern should be about doing the will of God in this world. Our concern should be about feeding those that don't have food or clothing. Our concern should be about being righteous, being holy as He is holy. Living out the fruits of the Spirit in our lives. Taking value in the simple things that God has given us. In living lives of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. And if we seek the kingdom first, God will provide our every need. If we put God first, God will take care of everything. We might not have everything we want. Hey, I can pray for a million dollars. I can pray for a mansion. But I don't need a million dollars. I don't need a mansion. And God doesn't give us what we want. He gives us what we need. And He's always on time. Amen? Amen. He always meets our need right where we are. He loves us. He cares for us. And that, ladies and gentlemen, should be something that should inspire gratitude and thankfulness in our hearts of this amazing, wonderful God who's given us our health, who's given us our life, who's given us the air that we breathe and our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren for some of you. So I want to take a time to, to honor our forefathers. Those Thanksgiving days that they used to participate in. To take a time right now of lifting up thanks to God. And so if you would bow your heads with me and close your eyes, I want you to look deep in your heart, in your soul, and reflect on quietly for a moment. What is it that you're grateful for? What has God given you that you just want to thank Him for today? Maybe many things come to mind right away. But I'd like you to just choose one of those things and, and let's spend a moment in silent reflection in a posture of prayer. And then at the right time, I would like each of us here today to lift up something to God that we're thankful for. time, hopefully you've got that one thing in your heart. Let's lift them up together to the Lord. Father, I thank you for the health of my family. You have something in your heart you want to lift up to God. Go ahead and speak it out now. 